hello friends welcome back and in this particular video we will be discussing various concepts of chromatography so there are uh, basic terminologies which we need to understand before actually dealing any particular chromatographic technique to begin with introduction as we know when we talk about analytical methods to analyze our particular analyte in the sample ideally as an analyst we expect the methods or analytical methods which should be very much specific to our analyte of interest and unfortunately most of the methods what we have or what are available all these methods are most of the times they are very selective rather than specific so obviously we require to separate those interfering substances or the impurities or the coanalytes and then we need to analyze them individually so separation is a must due to lack of availability of specific methods and hence what we do for separating our analyte from the interfering substances we use various separation methods traditionally we have used distillation extraction precipitation and so on and even till days we are using some of these methods for the separation however we have a very useful and very powerful technique to separate the components in an accurate way to a lowest concentration that is called as chromatography so all we know chromatography is basically a powerful separation tool which can be used to separate the constituents from its impurities or from the other interfering substances as we know we have studied the very primitive technique of chromatography that is paper chromatography where we use whitman filter paper and we spot our samples so usually i have shown here the paper so on this particular figure we can spot our amine acid let's say and then we develop this paper using a suitable solvent system and then by detecting these spots with particular chemical reagents like ninhydrin we could identify the compounds by comparing the rf value so this is very primitive chromatographic technique what we have studied in the previous classes now as you may be aware the michael swett was a russian a russian botanist and he actually considered as a father of chromatography because he has first developed the chromatographic technique in the year 1906 and there onwards lot of lot of improvements and sophistication has been seen and we have a very wide varieties of chromatographic technique nowadays which are used to a great extent not only in pharmaceuticals but in other fields also so what he did he took some plant pigments and those plant pigments were loaded on the top of this column and this column is nothing but it is similar to a glass burette which is packed with a stationary phase which is nothing but a calcium carbonate and then he poured the solvent system which was a petroleum ether and then what he found these plant pigments were separated into individual uh, colored bands or the fractions and as he was pouring the solvent system continuously and eluting through this particular glass column what was happening the plant pigments which were as a mixture which have been separated in the form of color bands so the, those were nothing but the plant pigments and they were colored so he could observe those color bands and he have been uh, separated those so that is how the chromatography has been uh, discovered and there onwards we have lot of uh, changes and modernization in the chromatographic technique so what actually happens when we see a chromatographic technique what is a mechanism of separation so we consider column so in this column we pack a inert stationary phase 
and these components what we load on a column let's say I have shown here the blue dot and the red dot so each compound has its own affinity towards the stationary phase as well as the mobile phase so based on their migration rate they move inside a column now in this case you can see the red component is moving faster because it has less affinity towards the stationary phase and when we talk about the blue component so blue component has comparatively higher affinity to the stationary phase and that's why it is moving slower so at the end of the column we should have some sensing device called as detector and then we can plot a chromatogram and we can record the peaks and from the peak we can get the information so you can see here the red component is eluting first so we have recorded the peak of first component in a red ink and then the second component has been eluted which is comparatively slower in elution so that is the blue one now as I told you due to the different interaction between the stationary phase the sample molecule move at different rate so you can see here when I load the sample the red one is having weaker interaction with the stationary phase so it is moving faster whereas the blue one is moving slower comparatively to the red one because it has a stronger interaction or stronger affinity towards the stationary phase now what is stationary phase so this is very uh, uh, popular and uh, common term used in all chromatographic technique as the name indicates it remains stationary or it remains steady in any chromatographic system so this is in fact the phase over which the mobile phase passes in a technique of chromatography and chromatography is a separation process as we know which involves two phases which is one is a stationary phase and the other one is a mobile phase so you can take any chromatographic technique whether it is a gas chromatography whether it is HPLC or whatsoever in all these chromatographic techniques one is a stationary phase and other one is a mobile phase so typically we use uh, the solid stationary phase which could be coated on glass or silica or uh, alumina and uh, this particular stationary phase is packed in particular glass column if it is a column chromatography or it could be packed in a metal tube if it is a gas chromatography or if it is a HPLC and uh, we have a lot of examples of uh, stationary phases so you can see here so in paper chromatography we have a liquid phase which acts as a stationary phase if it is a TLC we have silica as a stationary phase if it is a column chromatography we may pack silica or calcium carbonate inside this particular glass column and that will never move it remains stationary in fact it provides a surface for our analytes to interact and based on its own adsorption the analytes will be separated in a particular chromatographic technique so this is about the stationary phase the next is a mobile phase so as the name indicates it is a mobile it is not stationary so it moves over the surface of the stationary phase and it takes along with that the analytes which we have loaded or which we have spotted in case of it is TLC or if it is a uh, paper chromatography so typically the mobile phase is liquid in nature uh, usually a combination of different solvents and in some case when we see gas chromatography where the carrier gas acts as a mobile phase okay but in all other cases the mobile phase is usually liquid in nature which is a combination of different solvents so you can see here in this particular picture 60-40 acetonitrile water is a solvent system or the mobile phase used in especially the uh, HPLC and in this particular figure you can see there is a pressurized tank in which we have the carrier gas and that gas is acting as a mobile phase then next concept is a chromatogram so chromatogram is in short it is the output of chromatographic run it is an electronic file or hard copy containing the information generated during the chromatographic run so what we do in chromatogram we plot the elution time on x-axis usually in minutes and on y-axis we have the detector signal or its intensity 
or sometimes we take a volume of mobile phase add it and it gives a series of peaks which can be used for qualitative and quantitative purpose so in this case we can see we have observed three peaks so that means three analyte are present in a particular sample so this is basically a chromatogram and chromatogram have a lot of information which can be used for identifying as well as for quantifying our analyte what we have separated from the mixture coming to the next point that is a separation mode so usually in chromatographic system based on what stationary phase and what mobile phase we are using we can categorize the chromatography in normal phase and reverse phase so what is meaning of normal phase so in case of normal phase chromatography the stationary phase is polar the nature of the stationary phase is polar in nature for example if i am using silica or silica gel which is one of the most widely used stationary phase in chromatographic system so that is polar in nature i can use the modified silica so on silica if i have the bonded atoms now in this case you can see it is a cyano type of stationary phase so this is a cyano type of silica gel then we have amino type then we have diol type now if we talk about the nature of the stationary phase so overall the nature of the stationary phase is polar in nature because it has a polar functional group okay so if we are taking the polar stationary phase obviously complementarily you have to take the mobile phase which is non polar in nature so we have lot of non polar solvents which are available in nature starting with hexene benzene methylene chloride chloroform carbon tetrachloride and so on so usually we have to take the organic solvents which are comparatively non polar so this is basically called as the normal phase chromatography or normal phase mode in this the stationary phase is having polar property and the mobile phase is having non polar property so that is called as normal phase mode okay so the first developer that is michael swett he has used calcium carbonate for separating the plant pigments so that is nothing but a normal phase chromatography so keep in mind in normal phase chromatography the stationary phase is polar so it will retain the polar substances okay and it will elute faster the non polar substances okay because it has stronger affinity to the polar substances and it has lower affinity towards the non polar substances then when we talk about the reverse phase mode so in this case it is exactly opposite or the reverse so in this case the stationary phase is non polar so we have a very popular kind of stationary phase that is ods that is called as octa decyl silane or we have c8 that is octyl or c4 that is butyl then phenyl and tms type of stationary phases or cyano so in this case we have the silica and then silica is modified with a chemical bonding to the uh, number of carbon atoms okay so you can see here c18 so that is octa decyl silane so as the number of carbon chain increases the carbon is responsible to have the non polarity okay so as the number of carbons are more the stationary phase is highly non polar so if i compare between c18 and c8 which one is more non polar obviously c18 is more non polar than c8 than c4 and so on as we are using non polar stationary phase so obviously we have to take the mobile phase which is in polar so here the choice of polar solvent system is the water or buffer or it can be a mixture of water buffer plus some organic solvents so the organic solvents which are preferred 
which are relatively polar that is methanol acetonitrile and thf and the buffers which are widely used that is phosphate buffer acetate buffer and so on so we can select a appropriate ratio and we can prepare a solvent system so this is a normal phase mode in which the stationary phase is non polar and the mobile phase is polar in nature so this particular combination is known as reverse phase mode now keep in mind in reverse phase mode or reverse phase chromatography the one which elute faster that is highly polar and the one which elute slower that is highly non polar okay now next point is the possible modes in chromatography so the first mode is a very simple mode which is known as isocratic elution or isocratic mode so as the name indicates iso is similar or same so in this case what we do we maintain all conditions and setting parameters constant for example i have prepared a solvent system let's say n butanol acetic acid and water so throughout the experiment i will not change the solvent system and its composition okay so the moment i start the experiment from that moment till i get the chromatogram or till i get the uh, eluted compounds i will remain i will keep the ratio of the solvent system constant so that is called as elution with constant mobile phase composition now you can see here in this particular figure i have shown you a and b that is nothing but the solvent solvent a and solvent b so its percentage or its composition have been kept constant over the period of time okay we are not changing so this is called as isocratic mode now in the second mode that is the gradient elution mode so gradient is nothing but a gradual slowly we are increasing one or more parameters throughout the experiment so for example i have started with a and b now what i am doing i am gradually changing the ratio of one of the solvent system let's say i have started with chloroform methanol in 9 is to 1 for 5 minutes after 5 minutes instead of 9 is to 1 i am making 2 is to uh, sorry 8 is to 2 it was 9 is to 1 earlier now i am making 8 is to 2 so what i am doing as i am increasing the concentration of methanol it was earlier one part now after 5 minutes i am making it two part of methanol and i am decreasing the volume of chloroform earlier it was 9 now i am making it 8 so what i am doing i am increasing gradually the polarity of the solvent system okay so when you change the composition of the solvent system or the ratio of the solvent system to increase or decrease the polarity of the solvent system gradually throughout the experiment that is called as the gradient elution so we you start with a particular ratio and over the period of time you keep on changing the solvent ratio or its composition to increase the polarity or uh, non polarity so that is called as the gradient elution now it can be understood with this particular figure now you can see here in the first figure this is isocratic mode so what we have done we have taken a solvent system as methanol water the methanol is in six part and water is in four part so it is 6 is to 4 and you can see the chromatogram so this is a chromatogram and by looking at the chromatogram we can see it is requiring long elution time so it is it is taking time to elute the substances whereas in the second figure i have changed the ratio i have made it 8 is to 2 earlier it was 6 is to 4 now i have made it 8 is to 2 so i have increased the polarity okay but keep in mind both are isocratic okay that means i have started uh, here with 6 is to 4 and i am waiting i have not at all changed the composition throughout the experiment same case here also but here i have selected a appropriate ratio of the solvent system so that i can 
elude the substances in a faster way. But here the problem of elution is the first four components are not well resolved. They have not been separated appropriately. Whereas in first case it was separated but the problem was the longer elution time. It was taking time. But in second case the time has been minimized but the problem with the separation or the resolution. Now the third figure is the gradient elution. Now in this case what we have done we have gradually increased the concentration or the ratio of methanol. Let's say we have started with uh, 6 is to 4. Now gradually I am increasing. I am making it three, uh, 7 is to 3. Then I am making it uh, 8 is to 2 and so on. So here what we are doing. We are gradually increasing the concentration of one of the solvent okay, over the period of time. So you can see here due to the gradient elution we could achieve better separation and also we can minimize the time. So if, if we compare the previous two here we are getting better separation and even the faster elution. Okay? So that is required in a chromatographic system. So gradient elution is usually preferred when you have the complex or multiple components to be separated and when the elution or the retention time between the component is very uh, minimum or they are very close then we usually prefer the gradient elution. Now we have a lot of uh, options to use a mobile phase to play with the uh, polarity and non-polarity of the solvent system. So based on what functional groups you have in your analyte we can select a mobile phase. So usually if you have aliphatic hydrocarbons then you go for non-polar solvents. If you have olefins you can go for again non-polar solvents. So here we have listed some of the functional groups and based on that we have uh, given the solvent system. Okay. So usually the acids or aldehyde and ketones or alcohols they are relatively uh, polar in nature. So based on that you can select the solvent system by looking at the polarity index and uh, you can uh, play with the uh, uh, solvent system and you can develop the appropriate mobile phase for, for your particular chromatographic system. The next concept is a retention time. Now retention time can be understood with this particular graph. So this graph is nothing but it is a chromatogram. So on x axis we have the time and on y axis we have a detector signal. Now you can see in this particular chromatogram we are observing the two peaks. The first peak which is at the leftmost side is a very small peak and this peak is usually the peak not by the analyte but this is peak by the your mobile phase or if mobile phase is not giving a peak we usually add some unretained species. Okay, So let's say you consider a column and then you have uh, added the mobile phase at the top of the column. So the mobile phase will also require some time to travel through the column. So from the top of the column to the end of the column. Okay. So in short it is a time taken by the mobile phase to travel to pass through the column. That is called as a dead time or white time and this time is abbreviated as TM and this peak is due to the mobile phase or if mobile phase is not giving this particular peak you can add intentionally some unretained species which can come along with the mobile phase okay so that is represented as tm then we are observing another large peak and this peak is due to our analyte now this analyte peak is due to the elution of our analyte. Now I can measure the time. Okay, So Tm is nothing but the time taken by the mobile phase or unwritten species. Then Tr is nothing but the time taken by our analyte which we have loaded on the column and this analyte is taking some time to pass through the column and come out of the column. 
so this is basically the tr so tr is very popular term used in chromatography especially for identifying our compound that is called as retention time so it is a time needed for each component of mixture after injection to reach the detector so tr is nothing but it is tm plus ts so ts is actual time spent by the solute molecule but tr is summation of tm plus ts okay so what we can do in chromatogram if we maintain ideal conditions then we can compare the retention time of our analyte with the retention time given in the literature and we can also identify the compound based on the retention time like what we do in uh, identifying the compounds by uh, by doing a melting point determination or boiling point determination now next concept is a planar chromatography it is a collective term including all analytical micro preparative and preparative separation methods where mobile phase moves through the stationary phase so we have a porous sorbent which is acting as a stationary phase and if this particular stationary phase is in a planar arrangement we call it as a planar chromatography so here the movement of compound is result of opposing forces the driving forces of the solvent system and the retarding action of the stationary phase so the planar geometry or flat bed has several advantages it is simple it is flexible we can do parallel analysis of large number of samples what we do in a paper chromatography or tlc we can spot multiple samples then we have various developmental modes we can do gradient as well as isocratic and we have uh, the selectivity and specificity using a chemical and biological detection methods the only disadvantage is it requires certain skill and experience to get accurate results so the planar chromatography we have examples so paper chromatography is an example of planar chromatography thin layer chromatography or tlc is also an example of planar chromatography and hp tlc is an also example of planar chromatography okay so these are the three examples of planar chromatography which are widely used so the stationary phase is arranged in a planar arrangement coming to the next point that is a retention factor it is abbreviated as k it is very important experimental quantity widely used to compare the migration rate of solute in a column so k is useful because it doesn't depend on column geometry or on volumetric flow rate it means that for any combination of solute mobile phase and stationary phase of any column geometry operated at any mobile flow rate it will remain same for example for analyte a if i want to calculate the retention factor it is tr minus tm so we know now what is tr it is a retention time tm is a void time or dead time divided by tm so if we find out the ratio we can get the idea about the migration rate of our solute in a column so ideally the value of retention factor should lie between 1 to 10 next point is a signal and noise or it is also called as signal to noise ratio this is very important in instrumental techniques not only in chromatography but in all other analytical methods where we use the instrumentation so signal is nothing but it gives an information about our analyte of interest and noise is something which is not required or extraneous information unwanted information because it degrades the accuracy and uh, precision of our analysis and it also places a lower limit of amount of analyte that can be detected now by looking at this particular uh, chromatogram you can see you can see the one which is highly intense that could be our analyte signal okay so this particular peak is giving information about our analyte of interest 
However, at the baseline, we have certain lines that is indicating some kind of background or some kind of extraneous information along with our analyte due to some XYZ reasons. So that is basically the noise. So noise is unnecessary. It is not required where we require the signal that is having the information about the analyte. So when we uh, when we talk about the uh, better instrumentation so we have to ca calculate the signal to noise ratio so signal how much intensity of signal divided by the intensity of noise so that ratio should be higher higher the ratio of signal to noise better will be the instrumentation okay next point is a symmetry factor or it is also called as a tailing factor so symmetry factor which is abbreviated as s or also known as a tailing factor is a coefficient that shows the degree of peak of symmetry. So ideally all of you know in any chromatographic system we expect the bell shape curve or the Gaussian type of peaks. Now you can see in this particular chromatogram this is not a Gaussian shape okay because if I bisect this particular peak right I cannot overlap these peaks on each other. So you can see this particular portion is having higher area compared to the first part of this particular peak. And we are observing a kind of phenomena or effect that is called as a tailing peak. So this is a tailing peak. Okay, It is looking like a tail and we can calculate how much symmetry of peak is there. Now to calculate this particular symmetry we have formula we have to measure the width of that particular peak at 120th of this particular peak height now what you do when you uh, get the peak first you have to draw a vertical line from the peak top which can dissect the horizontal line and this horizontal line is drawn in such a way that it is drawn at you have to measure this total peak height and you have to make the distance 1 by 20 that is 0 0.05 height of this entire peak okay so this particular peak height you can measure and then you can take the 20th part of that so that will be around 0 0.05 height of that okay so you have to measure this particular you have to measure this particular distance okay so this distance divided by 2f divided by 2f so that will give the symmetry factor okay so if the symmetry factor is greater than 1 we observe there is a tailing of the peak if the symmetry factor is 1 we can we can say the peak is ideal it is in gaussian distribution and when the peak symmetry or the s value is lesser than 1 then we can observe the leading peak okay leading peak it is exactly opposite to the tailing peak now the next point is a asymmetry factor asymmetry factor is a measure of peak tailing it is defined as a distance from the center line of the peak to the to the back slope divided by the distance from the center line of the peak to the front slope with all measurements made at 10 percent of the maximum peak height okay so can see here this is a peak so we have drawn a vertical line from top of the peak bisecting the baseline then we are taking the 10 percent of the peak height we have measured the total height so you can see here so this is a 10 percent of the peak height so we are taking the ratio so this particular distance cb or bc divided by this ac or ca so this ratio is nothing but asymmetric factor okay and you can see here in this particular peak we are observing a fronting okay or this is called as a leading peak and on the other hand this is a tailing peak so in the fronting peak we can see the value of fronting peak is always less than 1 so if I calculate asymmetric factor the value is less than 1 so here asymmetric factor value is 0 0.74 and tailing factor 
what we have seen in the earlier slide that is 0 0.82 so we have seen if the value is less than 1 it is a fronting peak if the value is greater than 1 it is a tailing peak if the value is 1 it is exactly the Gaussian shape or it is an ideal peak ok so we can see here this is an excellent peak because it has a very good symmetry in its shape this is 1.2 a symmetric factor is 1.2 it is acceptable ok so it has a little bit tailing and here you can see a symmetric factor value is 2 that means it is not acceptable because it has a very uh, high uh, kind of tailing effect then talking about the resolution which is indicated as small uh, capital R and small s so this is the equation which indicates the resolution that is difference between peak retention time divided by average peak width the resolution is represented as a numerical value such as 0 0.8 1 or 3 and ideally as per the guidelines the resolution should be greater than 2 so if we are getting the resolution value is greater than 2 that means we have a very well resolved or separated peaks so to calculate the resolution you should always have to have minimum two peaks and then we can calculate what is the retention time so retention time for tr2 that is a second peak which we usually have a higher retention value and then this is tr1 so you have to take a difference of that divided by the width 1 plus width 2 and we have to take half of that ok or you can take half width of uh, first peak and half width of second peak so that ratio it should be always greater than 2 that is the ideal value so you can see here in the first figure we are able to get the idea that there are two peaks but these two peaks are not well resolved at this particular point they have been merged so if I calculate the resolution for this particular peaks the resolution is 1 whereas in this case they have been comparatively better so here the resolution value is 1.5 ok so still this is not good they need to uh, touch to the baseline and then uh, we can uh, have a better uh, separation and quantification with respect to that you can see here the resolution value is 1.1 we could get uh, or see here there are two uh, peaks here but they have not been uh, resolved in fact they have been merged very well with each other and these are poorly separated here it is 1.3 so there is a partial separation and here you can see the resolution value is 2 so this is the best one and they have been separated very well and we can use these peaks for our qualitative and quantitative analysis so that's all uh, with the first part thank you very much